This Veterans History Project interview is being conducted on Wednesday, uh, August the 30th in the year 2017 here at the Niles Main District Library uh, here on the third floor in the boardroom. Uh, my name is uh, Neil O'Shea and I'm a member of the reference staff here and I'm privileged to be speaking with Mr. Dennis L. Nilsson. Mr. Nilsson was born on June the 11th, 1946 in Chicago and now lives in Niles. Mr. Nilsson learned of the Veterans History Project through the Vietnam Veterans Group that meets at the Niles Dunkin' Donuts on Tuesday mornings. And uh, Mr. McGill uh, arranged for uh, the library's uh, project to be uh, discussed at the meeting. And uh, Mr. Nilsson has kindly consented to be interviewed for this project. And here is his story. Um, may I call you Dennis? Yes. During the interview? Yeah. Please do. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming in today and also for uh, completing the, um, the biographical uh, uh, information sheet. So, uh, Dennis, do you recall when you entered the service? It was uh, September of 1967. And uh, in September of 1967, were you living in Chicago at that time? Yes, I was on the northwest side. Oh, any particular neighborhood or... The Humboldt Park area. Humboldt Park. Um, can I ask what uh, what school you high school you attended? I went to St. Philip Basilica High School on Jackson and Kedzie on the west side of the city. Oh yeah. I interviewed a World War II vet who lives in Niles, Mr. Kenneth Lee. He also attended uh, St. Philip's back in the early 40s. You know. So what were you doing at the time? That you were you drafted? Yes. And what were you doing at the time you were drafted? I was in school. Um, it was the summer between classes, but I had to drop out in the spring class because I got sick. So I dropped out of school, and about August the 26th, I came home one Saturday afternoon. I was driving a truck for Ruby Dry Cleaners on the in the in Chicago, and. Uh, my draft notice was sitting on the table where they left the mail for us. And uh, I told my parents, I said, I'm going to go into the Army because this war isn't ending anytime soon, and I could stay in college for four years and still get drafted. So I decided to go in. So what school had you been attending when you had to leave take a break from your studies. St. Procopius College in Lyle, Illinois. Yeah. So as long at that time then, uh, as long as you were in college, you would have been able to, uh, you would have been awarded a, a deferment until you're yes, completed? Yes, it, it was an S2 deferment. S2. Now that wasn't the time when people got draft numbers, was it? Like, No, that was before. Before. So did you, did you pick the Army to go into? No, they picked it for me. They picked it for you. Was there a tradition of military service in your family? No. Um, my oldest brother was in the, went into the Coast Guard. Um, my father was born and raised in Ireland, became a citizen here, but was never drafted or inducted into the World War II. And then uh, where were you inducted? Do you, was it... Uh, in Chicago, it was on Van Buren Street. It was the uh, Selective Service headquarters, and that's where you would go down and report for um, physical. And then, a few weeks after you passed your physical, you'd get your draft uh, date. And. Um do you then report to Fort Sheridan or some? You or report, you report to the building on Van Buren, which is still there. Um, then from there, they took us to Union Station. Union Station, we were put on train to Fort Leonard to St. Louis. 
Then in St. Louis, we were met by buses, and they bused us to Fort Leonard Wood. So that's where you had your um, your basic training in? Yes. Fort Leonard Wood. So had you been at home, away from home for a length of time in your life before this Army service? Not at all. So this is a kind of a new experience? Yes. So what was it like being away from home and drill instructors and living conditions or lifestyle adjustments? Or um, I, it was a new adventure. It didn't bother me one way or the other. Um, basic training, the physical agility part of it was uh, relatively easy for me. I played football in high school. So in the Chicago Catholic League, and at that time it was one of the most powerful football leagues in the country. And uh, I felt that the physical agility was not very taxing. And um, you didn't mind the food or? No, food was OK. And uh, I imagine you're meeting lots of people from different parts of the country. But everybody was kind of a, a good guy, no problems? No problems. Um, to speak of, there were incidents once in a while something would pop up, but it wasn't wasn't something that was uh, systemic. Mm -hmm. Well, um, of course, when you're young, um, you're kind of naturally optimistic and you know all kind of an adventure and it's fun. But um, um, the war in Vietnam at this time is getting a little hot, right? I mean, there's there's Casualties? Was, were you all any of you worried, or or did you know you were going to go to Vietnam when you were there? Not necessarily. We pretty much knew we were going to Vietnam. Very few. When our orders came in after advanced individual training, um, very few of us were sent any to any other place but Vietnam. A couple guys went to Germany. Some some of them went to other bases in the United States. So did, you, did you all think they were lucky to have got those assignments, or? Oh yeah, yeah. Nobody wants to go to a real war. I mean, it's it, it is scary. It, it's, uh, but it was an adventure. So um, you wound up in the. So you complete the six weeks, of eight eight, eight weeks, weeks of basic basic. Training. And then you're assigned to the 25th Infantry Division, or? No, then I went to eight more weeks of advanced individual training called AIT. And that was to be a combat engineer. And um, that was, I didn't leave Fort Leonard Wood. That's where they trained the engineers. So I did my basic training at Fort Leonard Wood, followed up by eight more weeks of AIT um, training. And then from there, Went home for two weeks on a leave, and then went to Vietnam. Were there any buddies from your from the old neighborhood that were along, drafted at the same time as you were? Or no, no, by myself. You by yourself, yeah. And um, were you chosen or selected for the advanced individual training? I mean, everybody didn't get it, right? Everybody gets a, uh, some some training after basic training. It's called an MOS, mm -hmm. um, military occupational. Mm -hmm. It's an equivalent specialty or service specialty, or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, you take a battery of tests when they when you first get into the army, and that's how they kind of select you for your um, advanced training. So I, instead of getting infantry training, which probably 90% of the people in my training, my basic training company, went to the infantry, I went to the engineers. It was, um, and then engineers in the army, they build things or they? You build, there's construction engineers, there's heavy earth moving engineers, there's combat engineers, which kind of tells you that they're in, they're not just building buildings, they're doing fighting. Um, the combat engineer uh, 
fills in his infantry if needed. Um, we do our we'll, we'll do land clearing. We'll build bridges. Um, we mine sweep. We do explosives. We work right alongside the infantry. So when you were at St. Procopius, had you completely were you like a freshman or a sophomore? I was a sophomore. A sophomore. And, and in, what was your major? Was it in sci was it going to be in science or in math or technology or anything? about history? Oh, history. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, so you were, after you you successfully complete the 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 um, combat engineering advanced individual training in Fort Leonard Wood. Right. And and you get a time to come home. Did you say they gave you two weeks to come right. break? Yeah, yeah two week uh, leave. And then you, and then and then where do you go? Back to where do you join the unit then? Or from there, I went to Oakland, California. Is that by plane or right? Mm -hmm. um, flew to Oakland, went into the reception center in Oakland, and then they started processing you into. You get a number and you get a flight number and they call your number and you go get on a plane and you go. But you're there for about two days. The plane from Chicago to Oakland, that left from Midway? No, O'Hare. O'Hare. And was it a military transport? or No, it was a common carrier. Oh, and were, yeah. were you in uni Did you have to be in uniform for that trip? or? Yes, because um, I had to pay for that trip. So I, you, do, you would go by what was called military standby and you'd get a heavily discounted airfare to get get you out to Oakland. And then from Oakland you fly to Hawaii or? We, we went up over the top instead of going around Hawaii going to, from Los Angeles or California to Hawaii is going around the world Instead, we went over the top. It's a shorter, shorter mm -hmm. route, and we we went from uh, Travis Air Force, Army Air Force Base, or no, Travis Air Force Base in California. We went to, from Oakland to Travis, Travis to Anchorage, Anchorage to Yokosuka, Japan, and then Yokosuka into um, Tansanut Air Base or Saigon Airport. Quite a few miles. Um, about 23 hours. Wow. So um, you got to help me here. So you, you land at Tansanud Air Base. Is that near Saigon or is it? That's Saigon's International Saigon's Airport. Saigon's International Airport. Or as today they call it Ho Chi Minh's International yeah. Airport. Yeah. And there must have been other men on the plane like yourself who were on the flight from Travis and Japan and there yeah. were, the plane was filled with us. Yeah. yeah. There were no classes of like first class, business class. It was just one, all the seats were the same. And were any of those um, other soldiers, were they people that you remembered from basic training or who no. had become friends or companions or no? No, yeah. none of them. So then you, you get off the plane in Tansanut and what's the weather like? Does it make an impression on you? or? It's a little hazy, not not real hazy. You could see the sun. Landed at 5:30 in the afternoon on February the 29th, 1968, and it was raining. There weren't clouds up there. It was a haze. Yeah. But the air was so wet, so full of moisture, it was actually like little raindrops were falling. And I remember looking up at the sky thinking, where's the clouds? But the humidity was just, it took your breath away when you got when you stepped off the plane. And then from Tansanut, then you get into a, a bus or a, a bus with screens on the outside of the bus so that nobody could throw a hand grenade at the bus or rocks or anything that would break the windows and injure the occupants of the bus. So you were put on these buses and transported to, uh, oh, I can't think of the name of the base where they processed you in the country. Mm -hmm. 
And you stayed there that night then where they found You stayed there for, again, it was a couple days to process you and do the paperwork and that. You had to stand the formation every morning, afternoon, and evening. And they would just call off a list of names and they would say, Nilsson, Dennis L., 25th Infantry Division. And they did that to me, and they said, Nilsson, Dennis L., 25th Infantry Division. There was a, hundreds of soldiers there, so they didn't know, but I just yelled out, I'm an engineer! Because they were telling me I'm going to the infantry. What I didn't know was that the 25th Infantry Division had its own battalion of combat engineers. So they didn't have to wait for other engineers if they needed them. And then you, uh, and then the where is the base of these combat engineers in the 25th? Is that at another place? Another, yes. Where is that? Or that was in Kuchi. That's also in South Vietnam. In South Vietnam, it's it's about oh, I'm, I'd have to guess it's probably about 20, 25 miles from Saigon. The 25th Infantry Division was positioned between Saigon and the Cambodian border, an area called the Parrot's Peak in Cambodian border, mm -hmm. where the border comes south and then it goes east and then back west and it looks like a beak of a parrot. And that put Saigon within 60 kilometers of Cambodia. And that was the shortest route where they would come down the Ho Chi Minh Trail to the Parrot's Peak, to the Parrot's, tip of the Parrot's Peak, and then they would start infiltrating into the Vietnam, South Vietnam. Um, so the, the, the Army food is still pretty good? Still? Yeah, it was still fine. So, um, so the, that that base where you're assigned, then how long are you there for? I was there from uh, February, the end of February, till um, sometime in June, and then we were moved. My company was moved to another major base of the 25th Infantry Division in Tainin. Tainin. And that was right on the Cambodian border. Tainin province was, that was the border with Cambodia and the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So, what would have been a, maybe, I don't know, were there typical days, what you would expect? I mean, there were quiet days, days that you'd get a little laxed. Um, there were more than a few of those. It got very repetitive and um, kind of like Groundhog Day sometimes. Yeah. You'd get the same assignment every day. What would that be, to patrol or look for... Or mine sweeps in the morning. We'd go out with the infantry in the morning and mine sweep a section of road for the convoys to come through. And um, then after we were done mine sweeping the road, we pull security on the road so that nobody could sneak up and attack the convoy. And for I don't know how long it was, a month, two months maybe, I mind swept the same stretch of road every morning. Did you learn how to operate a minesweeper at Fort Leonard Wood? Or? Yes. Yeah. I gotta say one thing about the military training. They have training down to a science. The training that I received in Fort Leonard Wood to be a combat engineer prepared me very well to become part of a unit of combat engineers that I fit in. All I needed was the guidance from somebody that had been there for a while and knew the ropes and what to look for. As far as operating equipment, we were well trained. Did your, did your schedule, like, Sleep schedule change a lot, or did you? Were there was there night duty, or not necessarily? Or you were pretty much a daylight operation at this time. Daylight operations. Yeah. Uh, you know, the old saying was we had we had South Vietnam during the day, and the VC and the um, Arvins, or not the Arvins, the uh, 
army from the north um, had the country at night. Um. Did you have to worry about was it the weather? Was it um, very very hot and was it hard to sleep at night, or you got to worry about bugs or insects or malaria, or you've got mosquito oh, yeah. screens and all of it, all, all of, of it. the above, uh, malaria, mosquitoes at night were ferocious. Um, sleep was pretty much. Um, we slept at night, unless you had guard duty, and then you would do two hours on, four hours off, two hours on, four hours off. So if you got guard duty and you, you know, pick, pick the straws or flip the coin, you could get guard duty from six in the evening till eight o'clock, then you'd be off until midnight, and then you'd have midnight until two o'clock. And the other two hour segments were um, 8 till 10 and 10 till no midnight. So if you pulled um, guard, guard duty at night, you wouldn't be expected to go out on patrol the next morning, or would you? Oh, yeah. You, you, you just have to recover and, yeah. Yeah. And what, were there fans? Was there electricity for fans there? Or? There was um, electricity in my company area. We had a generator. And they would run the generator from 6 in the evening until 10, I believe. And that was pretty much it. Then they'd shut it down. And then every day there would be, the base would have trucks going in and out or? Right. You didn't have planes or helicopters coming in. Yes. You did on that also. There were that air also. strips. There were air strips. And these, these were big bases. They mm -hmm. were like small cities. Um, Kuchi and Tainan. And um, they had airports, heliport, helicopter airports. Um, they had everything, everything you needed. They had a big PX there. So a PX is where you could go and buy cigarettes, you could buy cameras, you could buy yeah. pretty much anything you wanted. Did, did you smoke or drink beer at that time? I did both. Oh, okay. I did both. Yeah. I, uh, Smoking is something you pick up in the Army. It gives you something to do. I didn't smoke before I went in the Army, and I didn't smoke after I got out of the Army. Just smoked in the Army, and then for a little while after I got out of the Army, I smoked, but then I quit. Um, and um, was it easy to stay in touch with your family while you were uh, telephone card? Calls or postcards or letters or letters, letters, yeah. letters. You'd send a letter off with a question on it, and you'd get an answer four weeks later. Four weeks later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sometimes the mail would get back in three weeks, but most of the time it was. And you didn't have to worry about uh, censorship of. Not at all. Not in this war. Yeah. Not at all. Um. This is a question here, so. Um, you went from one base, Kuchi, and then you went to Ten Tainin. Tain Tain uh, but you're still in that between South, between Saigon and Cambodia area. Yes. Um, was there a lot of daily pressure and stress, like you, were there, or a sense of danger, or? Well, there was always a sense of danger. You were always watching and. Mm -hmm. But it, there were days, like I said earlier, there were days and days that would go by and nothing was happening. And then all of a sudden, all heck breaks loose on you. And uh, you, you know, you're going out trying to get somebody out of trouble or help out somewhere along the line. But it was, uh, it was quiet. We used to... They'd send movies over, and we had projectors, and Italians would have projectors and get movies. And we, I was stationed at the Rock Crusher in Tainan. There was a mountain in Tainan that went up 3,200 feet, and it uh, was the only mountain that you could see. There was no other mountains around. There was just this one mountain, 3,200 feet. 
and the rock crusher was a rock quarry that we had created there because we used rock to reinforce the roads. And um, we'd watch a movie at the rock quarry and you could see the cigarettes that the guys, the Viet Cong or the North Vietnamese Army soldiers were smoking, sitting up on the mountain watching the movie too. Wow. Wow. Yeah. There were only two ways up the mountain. Either walked up the mountain, which meant that you really had to be trained in climbing a mountain, and the other way up was a helicopter. When I went back to Vietnam uh, in November of 2015, you can now take a tram up the mountain. So 50 years later, um, they're they're thinking about tourism. Yeah. Did you go up that same mountain in a tram? And yes. Oh wow. Yes. That must have brought back memories. Um, <coughs> it what it what it did as we were driving out to the, to where the mountain was in Tain In. I was talking with my two brothers who I went to on this trip back to Vietnam with, um, and um, they were looking out the one side of the vehicle and I was looking out the other side of the vehicle. And one of my brothers says, hey, is that your mountain? And I turned and looked at it and it was like, yeah, that's my mountain. I'm, I finally saw something that I really recognized from being in Vietnam was that mountain. And it, it, it gave me the feeling of, yeah, it was all true. It all, it all really did happen. Did um, they ask, did you, were you ever, and um, sometimes we see it on television here, like uh, Bob Hope or USO shows or entertainers. Did you have an opportunity to see any of those? None of the shows. Yeah, yeah. Um, <coughs> I did see Joey Bishop. I was, we were, we were stopped by a forward fire support base. These were smaller little compounds that we'd create overnight and bring in an artillery company with five cannons, and you'd move. They'd move around because the infantry would move around, and they had to get stay within a certain distance of the infantry should they need support. And inside the fence of the forward fire support base was Joey Bishop talking to some soldiers. And we were just sitting outside the fence looking at Joey Bishop. But he was actually out in the field. He wasn't in a base camp or anything. He was in the forward fire support base. So are you entitled to like a a few days of, of leave or R and R in this period, or and where do you go? Or? Yes, you were you were entitled to an R and R, a seven day leave, and a three day in country R and R. I never got the three day in country R and R. I got the seven day leave in uh, September of six nineteen sixty eight. I flew to Japan and met my middle brother um, in Japan and spent the week with him and some of his friends. Was he in the service also, or no? No, no. no. He was in the Marines and was stationed in Japan years earlier, but he was just back there on a uh, visit. So um, I noticed that. Um, you were a sergeant. Was that a series of promotions to private first class and then maybe corporal and then yes. sergeant? Yes, I went through basic training and my scores were good enough to give me a promotion out of basic training. So I, I was a private E2 when I went into my advanced individual training or AIT. I was a private E1 in basic training, a private E2 in um, advanced individual training. My scores and record in my advanced individual training got me a promotion to PFC, private first class. 
And then when I went over to Vietnam, shortly after you get there, they gave you another promotion. So I was a spe specialist for. Um, and I was a spe specialist fourth class, I, I don't recall, four months or so. And then um, I was promoted to sergeant with about 13 months in the Army. That sounds like it's good going. That, that was good going for me, not for some of the sergeants I had. Two of my squad leaders got sent home with injuries. Um, I held the squad from October till February when I left Vietnam. Um, and the guy after me supposedly didn't make it either. Suffering a mortal wounds. So um, those sergeants in that unit that suffered these um, combat injuries and these mortal wounds, uh, was that as a result of uh, artillery fire or sniper fire or mines or? No, the f one sergeant um, actually had set some charge, set a charge, an explosive charge, and then we were told not to set that charge off, and he went back to the charge to try and pull the blasting cap out of the charge, and when he did, it blew up in his hand and he lost fingers on his hand. So that that would send you home and yeah. you were done, you were finished. The other the other guy hurt his back and they they sent him home because he couldn't couldn't uh perform anymore. Yeah. So um you must have been a good um officer, if that's the right term for a sergeant. Did you see a lot of other good officers in, in Vietnam that you served under? Or? Yes. Um, again, my company commander was a, a very good leader. Um, his name was Captain Frederick Charles, and I remember that because one day he said to me, you know, I got two, I have two first names. And uh, I've managed to find him about three years ago and gave him a phone call and reintroduced myself to him and we've seen one another twice since then at battalion reunions. Um, do you recall any particular, particularly humorous or unusual or just odd events that, that stick in your mind or? Yeah, the, the funny stuff or maybe sometimes not so funny is the stuff that sticks with you. To come up with the bad stuff, I gotta work hard at it. And I, I think that's a little different than what a lot of people experience. They remember the bad stuff mm -hmm. better than they remember the funny stuff. But for some reason I uh, just remember the, the funny stuff that happened it wasn't funny. It wouldn't be funny in a non-combat situation. Somebody would say, what are you, crazy? But um, I was driving a truck one night down the road, and um, it was a five-ton dump truck, and they had brackets on the side of the truck that held the gas tanks on the truck. And I hooked the concertina wire or the bob wire um, for an Arvin compound and started setting off all their trip flares and their um, <laughs> anti-personnel mines because I was pulling their wire as I was going. The guy behind me had to flash his lights to get me to stop because we were driving with what's called cat eyes. They're just little tiny lights, markers on the corners of the trucks. and. Uh, I, you know, so the joke is it was the day I overran an Arvin compound, which is an army of the Republic of Vietnam, who we were on their side helping. Um, I damn near destroyed their their compound. Yeah, and the people in the compound must have got started to get excited when they heard. Oh yeah, activities and then, going. then they were yelling because they they could see what was happening, and I couldn't see it. I had no idea I was dragging that wire. That would have been like a night mission or something, or when you were 
when you were driving that. Yeah. 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 So do you, so you're watching the movie, and there's some of the the, the North Vietnamese army or the Viet Cong. They're watching the movie too. Yep. Um, so did, did did you think was the 25th then somewhat successful in in stopping the infiltration or very successful? Very successful. They uh, when Tet broke out, and I didn't get there until the very end of Tet. Tet started early in February of '68. I arrived there, as I said earlier, on February 29th, 1968, which is leap year day. Yeah. And uh, I remember thinking combat pay was $65 a month. And if you spend any time at all in a combat zone during a month, you received combat pay. We landed at 5.30 in the afternoon, and I remember thinking, wow, I just made $10 an hour, 65 and a half, six and a half hours, it was $65. And I remember thinking $10 an hour, and at that time, $10 an hour was big money. Yeah. But I remember thinking, $10 an hour. So um, passing time, do people play cards in the in the army or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, they play cards. They, uh, if there's beer around, they drink beer. Um, Are they American brands of beer? Or? Yes. Yeah. And then you're able to keep up with the sports scores at home and things like that, or the Chicago Bears or the Cubs or the White Sox or whatever? It, for me, it wasn't that important yeah. to keep up with that. Mm -hmm. um, you got Stars and Stripes, which told you it was a military newspaper. Mm -hmm. um, talked about some things at home that might be important, but it was mostly military focused on the military and Vietnam, what was going on in Vietnam. So um, you were overseas at the time of the presidential election then in the November of 1968. Yes. Yeah. So we were able to vote, obviously, over there, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 You, you got a uh, absentee ballot voted. So, um, so you're in this, this combat engineer battalion, and then your unit is in combat. Right. Yeah. We didn't do a lot of missions at the company size or the battalion size, actually never a battalion size operation, because what they do with the combat engineers is they split you up into squads, and then like my squad would go with Alpha Company, the second of the 27th Wolfhounds, and then two guys would go with A Company, two guys would go with B Company, two guys would go with C Company, and they, they, um, they would be um, demolition teams, a, a demo man and an assistant demo man. Did you always go with the same um, regular company or regular squad? Yeah, yes. Oh, you didn't? No, yeah. you didn't switch around. Yeah. You know, I had a squad. When I made sergeant, I was a squad leader. And I had... Oh, the squads weren't at full strength. Maybe I had eight soldiers in my squad that I was responsible for. Is the squad usually around 12? It's, a, it's larger. It's, it can, can be as large as 12, and I think it can be even larger than 12. So um, you received four, four campaign stars. Uh, do you recall which campaigns those were awarded for? Or? No, I um, I sent off to get my medals, and they sent back that four campaign stars. I've tried to figure it out. <laughs> um, I, I have a book that lists all the campaigns, but uh, it's it's hard to figure out. Yeah, because there was Tet, counter Tet, counter counter Tet. I mean, it was there were a lot of offenses. Campaigns that started yeah. around the Tet time, time yeah. of Tet. 
it, it seems like you were, um, were you surprised by anything in, during your service? Or it sounds like you were pretty well adjusted and you had an idea about what was coming and you had yeah. resources of person and training that allowed you to deal with it and uh, most of the people you were with seemed to be pretty fairly well adjusted. Yeah, yeah. We didn't have, uh, we didn't have uh, problems. We, we had good leadership, um, well trained. Equipment was a little tired. The, you know, like the bulldozer and the front loaders and the trucks. I think the trucks were all from the Korean vintage. Well then, uh, so you made sergeant. Did you ever think of making a career of the, of the Army? No. No. No, they offered me um, staff sergeant when I was getting ready to get out, and they offered me staff sergeant, and they also offered me if I took the staff sergeant, they were offering me a, to become an officer. And uh, I didn't want that. Why? Um, I didn't want to go back to Vietnam. I figured, you know, you, you tried it once, you played with the, the different outcomes, and just I just didn't want to. Military was not for me. So then, so your release or your um, your service, September the twenty sixth, nineteen sixty nine, the, the two years. Um, so the last couple of months, were you count, did you find yourself, oh, two months to go, or so many days to go? Were you doing that at all? Or I found that I, I started that the first day. <laughs> <laughs> started that the first day. Yeah, yeah. So, when you're when that when your term of service is up, then you're at um, that second base, Tay Tay Nin. Tay Nin. Um, and then from Tay Nin, was it the day before you fly out of Saigon, Chansanut, or a few days? A few days. Yeah. You you process out of the company. Then I flew down to Kuchi processed out of the battalion, then in Kuchi I processed out of the battalion, then you process out of the uh, division. And Is that I, also at, at uh, Kuchi? That was also at Kuchi. Mm -hmm. The battalion and the division were headquarters out of Kuchi. And then you flew out of Saigon? Then you, then you from Kuchi you got down to Saigon, you went to Tansanut. Um, you processed in, you got a number, you got a flight number, when that plane came in to pick you up, you got on it and you left. And that was a military plane back to Japan then? No, nope. it was a private, uh, like TWA I think it was, or Capital Airlines. At, at, back then there was a Capital Airlines. And that flew to? First place it flew to was uh, Okinawa. I had one of the last boarding passes for that plane. People going on a home on emergency leave, they'd get them out of country however fast they could, whether it was a military flight or... So they flew some people going home on emergency leave, got out of Vietnam, and they went to o o Okinawa, and then they would get priority on the next plane going to the States. The next plane was the plane I was on. They started with the person with the last boarding pass, worked their way up into the group, and I got bumped off my flight in Okinawa. I had a cousin who was stationed in Okinawa. I found him and spent two days with him, and then got on a commercial flight for dependents from the Marine Corps and the Navy, they got me on that flight, and I flew from there back to Travis Air Force Base, back to Oakland, California, to process back into the country, and then uh, flew from there to see my brother in California, and then home. What was your um, 
I was just thinking there, um, during the time in Vietnam, before you left, were there, uh, were there any politicians or generals who were visiting the bases to see how things are going or did no. you remember? No. No. Yeah, yeah. So what was your first day like back in, back in Chicago, it must have been? Back in Chicago, I had already been home for several days because I was staying with my brother in California. Yeah. My mother came up with the idea that I was injured, and that's why I wasn't coming home. Oh, mom. So I had to leave my brother, and we were hanging out together and having a good time, and uh, flew home and was greeted by my mom and my dad, my other brother, um, my fiance at the time. I was greeted by them, and, that, and that's when they could come right to the gate and meet you at the gate. Yeah, so, wow. And you're wearing a uniform. Right. Yeah. Still in uniform. Yeah. The, and then were you still, was the family still living in the Humboldt Park area? Yes. Yeah. And this lady that was the fiance at the time, you had known her before you went, before you went into the Army? Yeah, and yeah. you were in fourth grade. Oh, wow. Yeah. I sat behind her. Oh, dear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then you come, when you come back then, um, did you find you had difficulties adjusting to civilian life or? No, uh, no difficulties at all. Did you go back to the job with the, the driving or you went back to school or? No, I, they wanted me to come back and drive, but I wanted to become a police officer. So I took the test for the Evanston, Illinois Police Department and got the job in a couple of, less than a month and a half. Today, a candidate could wait years before they get on the job. I took the test on November 7th, 1969, and I was sworn in on December the 15th, 1969. So wow. it was a month and about five weeks. Well, that was, did you get advice to do that? That was pretty, pretty, pretty smart. Uh, I mean, you didn't even go, you didn't think of going into the Chicago police. They, you, they had a process where you'd fill out a little postcard, and then a year later they'd send you a, mm -hmm. a letter saying, come in for the test. The city of Evanston said, I went in there and asked the woman in the personnel department, what do you have to do to become a police officer? And she says, you, do you have four hours right now to take the test? And I said, yes. And she went back into the office and came out and she says, what do you want to be, a police officer or a fireman? I says, I want to be a police officer. Knowing what I know today, I would have been a fireman. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you must have blessed the moment you thought of going up to Evanston to find out. I mean, did you go to Arlington or Oak Park or nope. any other service? You just went to Evanston. Evanston got hired, the process was going so fast, there was no reason to go and you know, try another department. Yeah, so did you, did you take the elevated up there? You drove or? No, I had a car. You drove up there. Yeah. Boy, that was really uh, good thinking. It was fast. Yeah, so you didn't, um, some, I'm, I'm not sure about what I'm really asking, but there was no chance then, is, is there an equivalent of a GI Bill then available? To, would have been available to soldiers in your situation, or yes, but it was for school, and um, I wanted to be a police officer. And I didn't have to pay for going to the academy, or mm -hmm. did you always want to be a police officer? No, I decided I wanted to be a police officer when I was in. Fort Stewart, Georgia, after I came back from Vietnam, I was I spent six months still in the Army at Fort Stewart, Georgia, and there were posters on the walls in the company office that said if you became a police, wanted to become a police officer and you were registered in a certified police academy, any time during the last six months of your tour of duty, you could get, they'd give you the rest of the tour off to become a police officer. They were very... Uh, if you wanted to be a police officer, they didn't even give you the re-up talk. 
where they would call you in right before you were going to leave and they'd make all these promises to you. And uh, I saw that uh, Anchorage, Alaska was making $10,000 a year of police officers back in 1969. And I thought, I'm going to become a police officer. So it was originally it was a scheme to get out of the Army earlier, but that didn't happen. I took the test for Cook County while I was in the Army. I took the test for Elk Grove while I was in the Army. Um, and didn't get hired by either one of them. And by that time, I was close to getting out. So I just waited till I got out, and then I went to Evanston. So, so in v you, when you leave Vietnam, though, so it's um, if I may kind of double back here a little bit. What were the dates? What was the date that you flew out of Vietnam? Then, do you recall? It was the middle of. Uh, February. It wasn't quite a year. I wasn't there quite a year. I see. And then you come back. And then they, they so at that time, you soldiers had to spend a year in, in Vietnam. In, in you, spent, you spent a year. A year. In Vietnam. Then you could come home. And you don't know how long you'd be home, and they turn around and send you right back. But you spent a year. That was your tour of duty was generally a year. But you could be back there in less than six months for another year. Because at the time I was in Vietnam, they had built up to 550,000, no, yes, 500, it was a little over half a million troops, 550,000. Because they were in 68 and 69, they kept building and building. Then they started pulling troops out, and it was I believe it was Nixon that started pulling the troops out. And I voted for him because he was talking about ending the war. Yeah, he had a secret plan to end the war. Yep. Um, so then they, when they sent you back then, you still had time left on your commitment, so then you, they sent you to Georgia? Yes. And was that also as part of the 25th? No. No, I was part of headquarters company in Georgia. I was in an organization called Range Control. And basically what Range Control did, and it had nothing to do with being an engineer. We controlled the live fire of tanks because they had all these tank ranges down in Fort Stewart, Georgia. Um, we, can, we controlled the live fire practice that they that the infantry and the mechanized infantry had to do to, and the National Guard, had, they had to do for their required training. But we were the authority on those ranges. We would run the ranges. And then it's when you're down there, you, you hit on the idea of the police service mm -hmm. is a good avenue. Because yeah. I had from the end of February to the end of September to go. So March, April, May, June, July, August, September. I had seven months to do. If I would have, come, if you came back from Vietnam with under six months, you could uh, get an early out. But I came back with seven months. I could have extended for another 40 days, 45 days, and came home and be done with the army. But again, what I said was, I felt that I was lucky, I was blessed, I got out of there without being injured. And um, I just thought, don't, don't tempt, tempt faith. faith. Yeah, yeah. So then when you're, so you're, and then when you're down there in uh, Fort Stewart in Georgia, you're, you're already planning the career as a police officer. Yes. And then you, you know about some of these procedures and applications. And, yeah. Um, so, did you stay in contact with any of your wartime buddies after the after the service, or one, one, and we're still good friends to this day. We, he lives in Pennsylvania, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I live here in the Chicago area, and every summer for 
for probably a half a dozen years after we both got home, one of us would drive with our wives from, I'd go from Chicago to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. He Next year he'd come from Lancaster to Chicago. And then one of us, being the geniuses that we are, or were, realized that if we went halfway, <laughs> which was Cleveland, we could see one another more often every year. So we would drive 300 miles, 350, each of us would drive, and we'd meet in Hudson, Ohio. And this is a man you met in Vietnam or in... Uh, yes, yeah. in Vietnam. Yeah. And, that, and you're still maintaining that conversation to this day. Um, did you join a vet? You, you, did you join a formal veterans organization when you came back? No, no, not when I came back. I yeah. didn't join a formal veterans organization until two years ago. Um, pretty much forgot all about Vietnam. Um, didn't talk about it. So, did you? D the, the decision to visit Vietnam, though, was how did that come about? Was that, a, it was that, obvious, or no? It was not. Um, I have, as I've said earlier, I have two brothers. In 1986, when our father passed away at his wake, we made a pact that we would go somewhere once a year on a vacation. Just the three of us, no wives, no girlfriends, no pets, no goldfish. We just go, the three of us, on a trip. And my uh, one brother, the middle brother, um, called me one evening and said, what do you think about going to Vietnam this year for our trip? He says, I got a real good deal on a package, tour package. And I said to my brother, quote, unquote, I didn't lose anything there. I didn't leave anything there. I don't know anybody there. I'm not going back. And he kept saying, well, well, I got a real good deal. And I kept saying, I'm not going back. He says, well, think about it. In my mind, think about it meant a couple weeks would go by, the good package deal for the trip would go expire, and it would be over with. No, the next morning, about 8 o'clock, my phone rings, and my brother says to me, what do you think? I said, I haven't thought about it. I've been sleeping. He says, well, I bought tickets. So off I went to Vietnam for a second time. And for me, it was good. It was very rewarding. It was seeing the mountain just kind of reinforced that I did the right thing. Um, and that, I, you know, what we experienced when we came home um, that still burns in the hearts of a lot of ve veterans. Um, I, felt, I felt comfortable there. But also, the Starbucks on every other corner helps make you feel comfortable. Wow. And the Burger King and the McDonald's and the Kentucky Fried Chicken and the Pizza Hut. But there were Starbucks. And I was like, okay, this is an all right place. I can get Starbucks. Do you like coffee? I, uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Did you drink a lot? Did you drink coffee before you went in the army? No. No. No, the coffee went with the cigarette. Ah. <laughs> um, may I mention, so I always ask the, um, the lady that was your fiance, did you, did you marry that lady? Yes, so I'm still sitting behind her, and she's and she, so she saw you in your uniform then. Oh yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then um, your your career in um, you made a career then in the Evanston Police Department. Yes, I did. And you got you received more promotions there. Yes, I did. Y yeah, I held every rank in the department, from patrolman police officer to 
uh, I was the, in the last nine months of my career, I was the interim chief of police. And um, you have to think that your your military training and experience helped you in that in that career. Yes. In fact, I when I finally did find my company commander, Captain Frederick Charles, and I reintroduced myself to him because I knew he wouldn't remember one sergeant out of many in his company, and when I reintroduced myself to him, I thanked him because his leadership, what he demonstrated as leadership back when I was a soldier under his command, I took some of that, his skills and incorporated them into my leadership style, which I think proved to be successful because I was as successful in my career. How would you describe his leadership style? Um, Hands-on. Um, tolerate honest mistakes, um, correct mistakes without being dis without discipline unless it was something that was very calculated. But uh, good solid leader, good solid. You knew you knew what his expectations were, and you knew what, what he was standing for. Um, Mr. Nielsen, I feel like we're coming to the end of the, of the interview, and there are always uh, two questions that the Library of Congress likes us to suggest. Um, uh, so in closing, um, I, I mean, you may already have really in a way answered this. Um, how do you think your military service and experiences in the military affected your life? What I just said, it, it, uh, I think we covered that. Um, police is a paramilitary organization. It's a uniformed organization. You carry weapons. You have responsibilities. You have... Um, You have great authority. Even if you're just a soldier, you're in a war. You can take a life and not be um, punished for it. In law enforcement, it's the only position in this country that you can legally take a life you, where you could be judge, jury, and executioner in a moment's notice because you make those street decisions in minutes, in seconds, and it takes courts months to decide whether the decision you made in seconds was the right decision. So the military did prepare me for law enforcement because of the paramilitary part of law enforcement. Um, did your, has your military experience, has it influenced your thinking about war or about the military in general? Um, I still respect the military. I, as I said earlier, the, the training they give, the, the, how they move, they can move thousands of people in a day. And in the course of moving them, they feed them, they take care of them. It's, the military's got it down to a science. And uh, I still, I believe in our military. I believe they're well-led. I believe they're well-trained. Um, even the more professionally trained military, the Delta Forces, the Green Berets, the Navy SEALs, they're highly trained. They're skilled at what they do, but they're also responsible for their actions and what they do. And I, that's what I like, I, I like about the military. And again, I tried to have, I was a big proponent of something called community policing when I was in the police department. And I believe that you'd work smarter, not harder. And um, I believe that the community and the police are... Sir Robert Peel, back in the 
1700s or the 1800s. 1800s. Robert Peel, yeah. Sir Robert Peel. Mm -hmm. He had nine principles of policing. And if you read those nine principles, they're as good today as they were the day he wrote them. They're still, the, the principles all work out today, even with all our technology and our, the principles are there and they, they still work today. And one of the principles, somewhere around the third or the fourth, in the middle of the principles, there's one that the police are the people and the people are the police. The police are only working and getting paid for doing what everybody's supposed to do. And the military, um, I'm sure Sir Robert Peel had a military <coughs> background. So uh, the military prepares you for a lot. So if you, if you steer by Robert Peel and Captain Frederick Charles, you're, if I remember the name right, you you should have a, a good police department. You should have people that are um, understand what the community is. You're part of the community, and the community is part of you. Um, <coughs> if 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 everybody worked and believed in Sir Robert Peel's nine principles. Um, we wouldn't be having the problems we have. And when I say everybody, I mean everybody. The citizens have their responsibility, the police have their responsibility, and if everybody did follow their own responsibilities, we'd be in a better place. Thank you. Um, Dennis, is there, is there anything else you'd like to add that we have not covered in this interview? There's probably lots of things I'd like oh. to add, but um, I think we've covered covered them, and I could give more um, examples of some of the things we talked about. But um, like the food, for instance. Yeah. What about the food? The, uh, the food was okay. It you didn't lose weight in the army. Oh, we all lost weight oh, you in did. Vietnam. We were all little, like little kids. But the sea rations were a little. The interesting thing about the sea rations, I get, I'm in Vietnam, and sea rations came in a a sleeve over a box, and then the, open the box, and in the box there were little boxes of individual meals, and um, they had a date stamped on them. And I look at one of the boxes of the sea rations that I'm about ready to open, and the date it's stamped on them is January 1946. The sea rations were six months older than I was. And I ate them. So the sea rations weren't so great. But I got an example of sea rations. This may be a little interesting. Did you ever see the sea rations? How they came in a box? I mean, I've seen, um, I'm not, we had an exhibit here. Uh, I'm trying to remember. When you returned to Vietnam, did you um, sense any animosity on the people toward American Americans or? None at all. None at all. They were, um, most of the people in Vietnam are younger than the war is old. So the war, it's like here, you ask kids about Vietnam, they don't know about it. So there was no animosity. In fact, I felt, I felt very welcomed in Vietnam and treated with respect and um, Saigon, Saigon has sky risers, I mean, 60-story buildings. Um, they have shopping centers that could they have stores in them that, that we don't even have in here in our shopping centers because they're such high-end stores. It, it was it was I was very impressed, and when I saw Starbucks on every corner, so sea rations. This is a miniature scaled box of sea rations. Sleeve comes off. 
There's a date stamped on the side of every C ration box. And when you open it up, there's 12 meals in there. 12 individual meals. Each one of those is a meal? Well, it, the sea ration box itself is this big. Ah, this is just a small example of what they looked like. And then on each box, it was stamped what the meal was. So is this a miniature model, or is this, this is a miniature model? Ah. But that's what sea rations. And they, they actually come with a date stamped on them. That has a date on it. Oh, yeah, on the bottom, on the end of it, it tells you what food is in there. Yeah. Meal, combat, individual, ham and lima beans. Beef slices and potatoes with gravy. Meatballs with beans and tomato sauce. Beef steak, turkey loaf, fried ham. And here's four other... Four other... Ham and eggs? Yeah, there was a ham and eggs. Spiced beef and sauce, chicken... Boned and pork steak. Yeah, well, there's some variety, I suppose. Yeah. But this is a miniature mock up. And I mean, this is how it really looked. I was, when I saw this, when I first saw this, I was shocked. At, where did you see that? Was that in a. At our Tuesday morning coffee meeting, coffee meeting, one of the guys brought it in. Wow and gave it to me. But that's what sea rations look like. So, so when food, when I talk about food, if you were in a mess hall yeah. or out in the field, they would fly a meal, they'd fly one hot meal a day out to the field for you. So for breakfast you might have sea rations, at lunch you might have sea rations, if you ate either one of those. But in the evening, they generally brought out a hot meal. Well, Dennis, thank you very much for an enlightening interview. Well, thank you, and it's my pleasure, and I'm honored to have the opportunity to do this. Thank you, sir.